It's March Mania at Sports Interaction. We're talking mm. NHL, NBA, March Madness, MLB, and more. Just, just, just a lot going on. A little stressed out. It's, man- it's mania. Yeah. It's manic. Let's go. Anyway, uh, listen, uh, crazy odds and the best live in play. Download the app in Ontario. Use that QR code at the bottom of the screen or just head to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. That's right. Thank you to get started. Good job. 19 plus, please play responsibly. Welcome to Nailing the Apex. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. Write a review as it really does help us grow the show. You can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Australian Grand Prix this coming weekend. And here to help me set the table from fan graphs, it's Michael Bauman. Michael, what's up, man? How are you? Oh, oh Timmy. <laughs> Timmy, it's always good to hear from you. Uh, we were just talking about your pickle shirt, so my question, firstly, is dill, garlic dill, or gherkins? Well, you know, you said you wanted to talk about auto racing at some point, so I'll try <laughs> to keep it brief. But I think, like, you need a different pickle for every different application, because, you know, if we're just different talking occasion. about a, a sandwich, you know, I like a dill or a, a bread and butter, but, you know, if you're just oh, eating yeah, one out butter. of the car, bread and butter, I think, like, particularly the turkey sandwich, a little bit of mayo, mustard, That's bread and butter call. pickles, it's hard to beat. Dill pickle with... Either a ham or ch- turkey sandwich. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Not bad. You right? get some of the, you know, sometimes get you a good chop Kaiser up the, roll. You chop up dill pickle, put it with some mayonnaise and ketchup, make yourself a little bit of oh, yeah. secret sauce. There you go. I like that. Uh, if you want more uh, pickle recipes from Michael, you can get him on Twitter at <laughs> Michael Bauman. <laughs> Uh, dude, so you and I just are coming off of doing a uh, podcast over on The Ringer with uh, Megan Schuster. It was pretty awesome. Uh, for those of you who want to listen to it, head on over there. Give it a listen. Um, and we're doing Australian Grand Prix preview, so we're going to do it again here. But we have some updated news. So apparently Sergio Perez uh, no, uh, no longer is Red Bull a one-car operation, and he can now go and fight for a championship. Uh, one point separating both he and Max Verstappen, Verstappen leading the championship. I don't know, Michael. I don't see it happening, but hey. <laughs> you nothing can dream, would, right? Yeah, nothing would make me happier than for you to be proved wrong about this, Because, but, <laughs> I'm, but I'm with you. Um, it's... The, the whole thing about Checo is, you know, he's... I, th- I think the quality of uh, his quality as a racing driver, I think it's been overshadowed by what what Max Verstappen's done in that car and their time together. Um, you know, he we've seen he's exceptional on street circuits. You know, his tire management, his racecraft, he's just an incredibly savvy driver. And I'm glad that he's gotten the opportunity to race at a top team and you know build up that career win total a little bit. But as someone who can challenge maybe you know i was just thinking about this like if max verstappen wants to by the time he's done like he could end up holding all the records and ending the greatest of all time conversation you know i think in terms of peak performance it's just a matter of him having the equipment and staying on the level he's at right now and i don't know if anybody's you know capable of of of, uh you know, getting on a level with him week in and week out, particularly when he has that team just completely integrated into his own interests. And the, you know, the stuff that that he's done in terms of the, you know, Brazil or or sneaking up behind Checo and trying to close the gap last week or two weeks ago at Saudi Arabia, it's all so unnecessary. And a normal, you know, normal team, a normal team driver combination wouldn't continue to tolerate that but red bull does because they know what max is and if he you know it because he is that i i find it unlikely that this title challenge from sergio Perez is going to last the entire season as much as i'd love to be proved wrong it it would be it would be awfully tough i mean i think uh i think like so far this season michael like you know we're only two races in and look i get it but if we go back to like last season the car really did go away from him. I mean, the car ended up getting a lot lighter and then it kind of interrupted a bit with his driving style, didn't necessarily feel as comfortable with it because it got lighter. And, you know, for Max, that kind of really suited him. But, you know, on Thursday, he did he did make mention that he, he was starting to feel 
more comfortable in the car and he was able to extract more performance from it and it didn't feel like last season's car now for me that's got me interested because if he's able to you know keep it within striking distance with max he i think he can make this championship interesting but again it's going to come down to not making mistakes it's going Mm -hmm. to come down to making sure that that lab delta stays within about a tenth or two tenths not like last season where he was you know half half a second off and plus in some races and so i think if the the rb19 can continue to suit his driving style i think he can have a chance at winning this championship i just am i'm interested to see how red bull handles it if things start to go off the rails so if we remember back to i mean what was it vettel and weber i mean Mm -hmm. That that got out of hand. Like by the time they got to what twenty thirteen, and then multi twenty one came came into play at I believe the Malaysian Grand Prix. What it was, um, it, it got pretty nasty. And so, I just am curious to see if Christian Horner can handle two ultra competitive drivers battling for one drivers championship. What do you think? I think the Vettel Weber comparison is instructive because i think that you know it shows that red bull will back the um you know and maybe this has changed in the past 10 years you know it's been a long time since that happened but i suspect it's still the case but red bull will back the whoever they view as their franchise driver and i think the gap between vettel and weber as substantial as it was was is not as big as the gap between verstappen and perez and i think vettel as spiky as he could be you know early in his in his career is not as ruthless and has never been as ruthless a character as Verstappen is. And I think that if this, you know, under certain, under perfect circumstances, I think Checo can keep it close. But the, you know, the qualifying deficiency will always be there. And there's the fact that, like, he makes mistakes. You know, he has off weekends because he's a human being and not mm-hmm. whatever, you know, whatever kind of freak talent Max Verstappen is. Like, it, it, he's, he's going to have a bad weekend every so often. And, but let's say he limits all that, limits that qualifying delta that you were talking about, and keeps it close. I think the the mind games and the the dick swinging that we've seen from from Verstappen, you know, at the end of last season, early this season, directed at somebody who really shouldn't threaten him. I think that will increase, you know. And dating back to Monaco, you know, we've seen seen his camp uh, not. Max himself, but people close to him say some kind of nasty things about about Checo, you know, on social media, and it's. I think all that would intensify if if he ever came under genuine threat, and I think that Checo would find out just how stressful it is to mount a legitimate title challenge because you know it. There's no shame in not being up to that because you know we've seen all kinds of great drivers just not have that extra, you know whether that's a a tenth of a a second in in pace or, you know, that extra 10% of ruthlessness, you know, lots of people have have gotten to Checo's level and not been able to put it over the line. Yeah, that's, um, excuse me, that's that's an interesting point that you make. I mean, if you you go back and you take a look at some of these sort of rival, inner team rivalries between, you know, drivers who are battling for a championship, I mean, the, the obvious one stands out that's, Probably Hamilton and Rosberg straight up for that one, and the depths that Rosberg had to go to just to win that championship in 2016. You know, he flat out said, "Like I'm, a, I'm exhausted. I got to retire. Like this is, it just mm-hmm. took so much out of him." And I, I think you know, Verstappen's that same, that same type of uh, hard nosedness where. This thing could get really nasty. That's what that's what I think, and I think also um, that not that, that making sure that you can separate these two and not let it boil over too much. I think it's that's going to be impossible. I just think it is. I mean, it it, uh, it it's, for two drivers with the same equipment th- that no one else can kind of come close to them. I mean, it has to spill over. It just 
it just does right like that's just car racing and competition in general i mean yeah i'm here for it though michael i'm here for it <laughs> and particularly the kind of competition that is this level of auto racing yeah like, for sure but uh, yeah i'll draw a distinction between verstappen you know the just the, like the little brushback pitches he's been throwing perez throughout the past 18 months um and or 12 months i guess you know dating back to the beginning of last season it contrast that to the lewis hamilton valtteri botas situation because hamilton you know for as much as you know his humanitarian rep- reputation is deserved uh when it came down to intra-team teammate battles he could be as ruthless as anybody you know yeah. ask rosberg ask Alonzo asked Jensen Button, but he never really did what Max is doing to Checo to Valtteri Botas. Even though Botas, you know, had blistering qualifying pace, you know, would look like he was in the title fight repeatedly early in the season. Hamilton always knew that he wasn't an actual threat for team leadership. Yeah. And I think that if you know, it's a similar situation in Red Bull, but Verstappen is not he's expending what seems to be a decent amount of mental energy you know, looking over his shoulder when he shouldn't be, when he's clearly the fastest driver in that team and he's got clearly the fastest car on the grid. He's got absolutely nothing to worry about. And I, you know, I'm, I don't think this is going to affect anything long term. I just think that the Verstappen Red Bull combination is so much better than anything else out there. Uh, but I'm, you know, it, it's not what I would like to see from a driver who's this far out in front of the field. I think if Perez wins in Australia, we see this thing go to another level. That's yeah, what I think. I agree. I, and I, I don't really think it do. should. Like, I don't think that Verstappen should feel threatened by Perez yet. But Yeah, good point. Yeah, good point but for sure. But I, I do think he, you know, he only knows how to ratchet up the intensity. Um, Ferrari. So apparently we'll have some uh, new upgrades coming to the car uh, in the next few races time. And this car is going to look a little bit different apparently. Uh, it I, And this is where... You know, I find it interesting when it comes to the cost cap and the regulation change and the limit on CFD and wind tunnel time. Um, and, you know, you and I have talked about it before. I had mentioned Aston Martin on a on the other podcast um, a few days ago where look at where they started in 2022 and then look at where they ended up finishing at the end of the season in that sort of performance gap that they were able to close uh, under this current regulation. Do you do you think Ferrari could be able to get back into the fight with with uh, with Red Bull? I, I got, you know I think like Mercedes. And we'll get to this in a second, but I think like Mercedes could possibly. But I just I just feel like Ferrari has so much work to do with that car in terms of what it's like during the race. Yeah, and I, you know, I think Mercedes also has a benefit. I I think they've got two drivers who really know how to help develop a car in a way that, you know, I'm not to have any slight against, you know, the Chucks, but it, it, it's, you know, I think, I think Hamilton and Russell have, have always had a long-term view towards that team. Uh, whereas Ferrari, I think is, it, you know, can be accused of looking for a quick fix here and there. And, you know, can they develop the car, you know, can they catch up to where Red Bull is now? Absolutely, but it, it as as they're developing, even though Red Bull has the lower allowances for wind tunnel and CFD, and even though they're dealing with the the penalties for breaching the cost cap, and even though they're going to transfer you know their energy to developing the twenty twenty four car probably as soon as possible, it, they're going to keep developing. You know that that's not a stationary target, and I think that that's what not just Ferrari but Mercedes and Alpine and McLaren and everybody else that that's why they're struggling to to reel in what was a pretty big gap in performance and race ex- execution last year because you know, it's not just a matter of catching up you have to catch up to a moving target I think it's interesting like what we've been hearing out of Mercedes lately um, in particular them knowing before preseason testing that you know this car was was going to need a different design concept for it during the season and hearing hearing that and hearing that you know they knew that this was going to take place to take shape and that they were going to have some struggles i i think they've been working on something michael i think they've been working on it since either november or december and i got a feeling we're gonna we're gonna see it 
Now, whether or not this thing is going to be quick when it arrives, apparently, in, in Imola and a few races after, uh, is another story. Um, I don't know. What do you think about all of it? Because, like, for their car to get a total redesign, I mean, that the whole side impact structure is... Mm-hmm. You can't really do much with that. Like, it's... The way that they've built the, this, you know, the, the zero side pod concept and where they have the side impact structure that was made mandatory um, by the FIA a few seasons ago, they need a full chassis redesign to put that somewhere where it currently is, put it somewhere else. Like, I don't, I don't see that happening, but... Uh, well, I don't know, because it's it could be the sort of thing that McLaren is doing, that they realized too late that they were barking up the wrong tree, and then they, you know, are coming up with essentially like a, you know, a B-spec car, um, where they're, you know, saying they're redesigning the car, and they knew that it was going to be obsolete by opening day, but this they're just going to get it out as quickly as they can, and that means Baku for McLaren, Amala for Mercedes. You know, when they stayed with the the zero side pod concept, I thought that they had unlocked something. You know, I thought that just being the, in not just not just a different kind of design cul de sac mm-hmm. than than Red Bull, but just something that's so divergent from everything yeah. else on the field. Yeah, I agree. You know, they had a good look at that. They developed it a lot. It still wasn't as fast as they wanted it to be. You know, I thought that if they were going to stay with that they would have that would mean that they had unlocked something in it and yeah. so did they just waste another six races and a lot of resources trying to develop that you know to make that radical change in direction i don't know um but it everybody seems pretty bummed there uh so i don't know if, if that indicates that they just know they're further behind than they thought or if they uh genuinely don't have anything that they're excited coming excited about coming down the pipe you mentioned uh, McLaren, so let's, uh, let's talk about them for a bit. Yeah, you're <laughs> you had a hot take about this. <laughs> hey, listen, you're you're I, a level-headed guy. I, I did I, not expect this. <laughs> you know, did not expect this from you. Okay, what you said on the I, Ringer Pod yesterday. So I think you should reheat that take. Okay, so what I had said was, I think that they'll finish last in the constructors' standings, but I did but. say that they were going to score. Points and yeah, that's I'd not also like hold that. On, hold on. Okay. All right. All right. Hold on. And I'd also said before all of that that the midfield is as competitive as I have ever seen it in Formula One. So I'm not saying like they're going to be last by like third, like the, like from tenth to ninth. There's a thirty point gap. What I'm saying is is that they're going to be last maybe by a point, maybe by two points, mm-hmm. and that's separating them from like seventh, you know, like or eighth. And so that's how close I think it all is. For McLaren, they are going to need to hit a home run with their first major upgrade that they will be bringing to Baku. Now, they have three upgrades that they're bringing. They have one that's coming in Baku. They have another one that is going to be coming uh, before the summer break. And then they have another one that's going to be coming after summer break. This is going to be... Uh, a, a, a B spec car. So essentially, the car that they have now, it's going to look totally different after Baku and before summer break. Like this car is going to look massively redesigned. Uh, I just find it, I just find it concerning when your team uh, at the beginning of the season lets go of you know James Key and goes out and gets David Sanchez from. Ferrari, and then restructures your entire aero department because you now don't have a technical director that everybody can report to. And then also on top of that, you know, I heard from Andrea Stella on, on Thursday and hearing that, you know, a lot of the employees, in particular in the um, aero department, were being underutilized and you know this wasn't <laughs> yeah this wasn't being they, they weren't say. being used to the full potential <laughs> is, is what he said and in particular there was uh, the, the director of aero performance is peter uh pro drama like he wasn't actually being used to his full potential apparently according to andre stella so i just find all that it, it's it's not good but i mean if they're able to 
get this sorted and this different technical structure that they're trying to implement behind the scenes works, I mean, maybe they could finish eight or nine. Can I tell you my favorite part about your your take that you know, I first heard <laughs> yesterday? Do it's it. the second part where you said, well, they're going to finish last. But they are going to score a point. Like, that's this big, magnanimous, like, concession that you're making to... They're Oh, sorry. They're going to score (laughs) points, plural. (laughs) As if this is a big, magnanimous magnanimous concession that you're making to this team that wants to be back in the championship fight in the next three years. No, you're not going to get completely cornholed all season. Oh, dude, I'm going to eat those words for sure. You're not going (laughs) to... No question about it. (laughs) I, no the question. thing about this this midfield race being so, and particularly at the back of it, because you know, good weekend for Haas last week, and they or yeah. last race, I keep doing that. They scored one point, and so if you get like a fourth place finish, like that could be just that could just turn the, the championship completely on its head. Huge. And so, for that reason, I'm more optimistic about McLaren's ability to. Um, to climb up the ladder and make up ground quickly, but you're exactly right. They have to nail this Baku upgrade because they were behind, you know, just based on 2022. They yeah. com- like they completely humped the bunk coming into 2023, even more than as disappointing as, as Ferrari and Mercedes have been, McLaren even more so. And, like, that midfield is not getting any easier just like you said I, I will say the one thing is about it being so congested is like obviously it's not as easy to pass like the the 2021 Haas or the 2020 Williams or you know a complete no hope there's not really a no hope or car but because the the gap in terms of pace is so small you get a couple tenths that completely changes yeah. your your outlook and if we think that this Baku upgrade is going to be worth a couple tenths then you know you get Lando Norris qualifying in into Q3 regularly. He can make magic happen. I think they can, they can put out like a below average car and still score a lot of points quickly. Yeah, just because of that driver lineup too. I mean, and more mm-hmm. the more of the Piastri gets a better understanding of it too. I mean, the better off they're going to be for that because he's been pretty impressive, Michael. I actually didn't think he was going to start off as strong as he has, but you know, watching him in Saudi Arabia and battling with with Norris towards the end of the towards the end of that race, there was a battle between Logan Sargent, Norris, and Piastri, and I thought he I thought he did really well. It's pretty it was pretty impressive in terms of not being in a race car and in a race yeah. in like a year and i thought i thought he did quite well i don't know what, what do you think about the rookies in, in total i mean well piastri i think something i didn't appreciate you know obviously i was impressed by his results in the the junior categories and the fact that he had so many teams fighting over him because it wasn't just alpine and mclaren mm-hmm. williams wanted him too you know they were staging him to be this you know the next generation george russell and you know that speaks for itself but you know you think of it's certainly in the time that I've been following Formula One, you think of Australian F1 driver, you think of Ricardo Weber, yeah. you know, these are guys with a you know, a sense of humor, you know, obviously a cutting edge. But I was not prepared and Piastri also being as young as he is, got the baby face, but I was not prepared for like the completely dead eyed shark like assassin seriousness yeah. <laughs> that he brings to to this car. Yeah. Um so I think he could be a really dangerous guy once he gets his feet under him and once the McLaren is competitive. Uh in terms of the other rookies, you know being an American obviously I'm gonna stump for Logan Sargent, but oh, he's done great. He was somebody yeah. that uh, you know, I said this yesterday, but you know, I'm gonna bring the good stuff to your home pod too, so don't worry. Uh <laughs> He was a guy who it was impressive in F3 and sort of inconsistent during his full season in F2. And when he was on, he was one of the best drivers on the grid. But there was, you know, there were um, there were breakdowns, there were mistakes. You know, it you would seek seek out contact from time to time. Um, and I wasn't really sure what to make of him. And in terms of the uh, you know, the absolute ceiling of the top two American prospects, you know, I probably would have taken Colton Herta over him just in terms of of uh, raw yeah. ability from what I could see. But, you know, Sargent has adapted so quickly. He's so close to Alex Albon right now. 
Uh, and you think about it, he's only had two races. You know, yeah. only had one season above F3. And, and yeah. Albon is like quietly turned into as reliable a veteran presence as you will find on the on the grid. And if Sargent is close and he's still making mistakes, he'll iron out those mistakes as he you know gets into it. Uh, I'm very confident he'll score points as well. Uh, maybe this weekend, but certainly at some point during the season. It's interesting to hear from James Valls um, during the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. So back when James was at Mercedes, he actually um, brought Logan in to do a test in their simulator to see, like, okay, is this is this guy, like, any good? Like, do we think we're going to be able to move forward with him? And they ended up not going with him. And now Valls is, like, having to, to work with him because – he actually wasn't Valz's driver because Jos Capito is the one who brought mm-hmm. Logan in, and Williams is the one who helped fund that Formula Two season um, for him. But I think he's he's uh, he's turning James Valz's head around a bit more in the way that he's starting to see like, okay, this kid's got a lot of talent. Um, made some really great points about him keeping pace with with Alex Albon because. I don't necessarily think that that car is really geared towards Logan's skill set just yet, and he's been able to he's been able to make that thing sing, man. It's been pretty impressive to watch him so far, especially in Jetta. Um, reduction of F1 practice times moving forward. Formula One. This is something they could end yeah. up doing. Stefano Domenicali said last week that uh, he was a big supporter of maybe getting rid of the free practice sessions, um, saying that the public didn't like it. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with him on that side of things. Like, I can see with doing away with maybe two of the free practice sessions. It was interesting to listen to some of the drivers um, on Thursday. Um discussions on cutting down the three one-hour sessions, taking away the the data from engineers and taking away some data from the drivers as well, um, could create some mistakes for the teams. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think for George Russell, though, he felt the the experienced F1 drivers uh, didn't need so much the the free practice, but the rookies kind of did and felt that you know, some of that time could be passed down to the lower categories like Formula 2 and Formula 3. Um, would you want to see Formula 1 make some changes within their weekends, say get rid of uh, you know one or two free practice sessions and maybe give more time to, to the junior categories? Well, I think, you know, watching Formula 1 and then seeing how little time the F2, F3 drivers get on track, like it's sort of, it's, you know, it's it's instructive because I think mm-hmm. they definitely could use more and in terms of like building up those uh, junior categories as maybe spectator, you know, interest points in their own right. Um, to min- so from my perspective, it, you know, sprint races have always struck me as kind of weird just because that's not what I grew up with, whether, you know, F1 or IndyCar NASCAR, like it's just, you get the one, one race on Sunday and that's the, yeah. You know that's the big big event, and there's no other like points paying event. Um, but you know, I've seen people seem to like it. The drivers seem to like it. You know, Dominicali makes a good point of like having something meaningful on every day of the yeah. the Grand Prix weekend, which you know I find to be a hard thing to argue against. Uh, but you think about so th- like there's you know obvious. That would obviously be interest of interest for fans um, who now have something to see, you know something meaningful to see every day you know every day of the the Grand Prix weekend it would be of interest to um, to sponsors obviously to TV broadcasters Domenicali wants it uh, and the only holdups are the the teams and drivers and you know I would like to in general see maybe see a little bit more uh, time for like you know setup and development work just to try to you know, I, I think that might free up teams to be a little bit more creative in terms of design and setup. But if, you know, from what Russell said, if the drivers don't want it, if the organization doesn't want it, if the fans don't want it, if the sponsors don't want it, then who's out there really fighting for free practice? So, yeah, you know, good it point. Seems like I mean, given given who's lined up in, in favor of this, I'd have a hard time like seeing what the obstacle is to turning, you know, maybe going for an all all sprint race calendar or whatever shape that takes 
I'd find that pretty interesting. I like Lando's idea was basically going free practice one into into qualifying, and so that would be the only time you actually really had where. I guess it would make sense if it's 60 minutes, but then you got to look at it. Okay, so you got to get the car set up for quality and race. And then also you got to run through some tire simulations as well, fuel loads. It could probably be done within 60 minutes, but you have to make sure you're not going to crash the car and you have to yeah. make sure that like your your stuff is really dialed in and you're not making any mistakes throughout that session. And I think that's kind of like where, you know, Stefano may be coming from where it's it's kind of like these teams get so much track time that they've they've really got all of this stuff nailed down. But the, by the time they get to, to qualifying, they know exactly what they need from the car and driver. Where if you were going to throw a wrench into plans, you would you would take away some of the practice, so they don't have all of this figured out, and they're really just tap dancing their way through it. I find that interesting. I, yeah, I would that watch could be it. a useful thing. You know, yeah. I think we could use a little more randomness in F one. Yeah. My the only thing about that is like you want randomness in order to generate unexpected results. Yeah. Um, and the teams that are best situated to field a wrench that's thrown at them are going to tend to be at the top of the grid. Yeah. So ma- you know maybe this is a, a situation where you get you know get a a midfield team that's just just really really good at trackside operation and they can turn this into an advantage and you know pull pull some surprising results out of hat you know if mercedes and red bull and ferrari can't optimize their car to within an inch of its life uh you know there could be some opportunities but also i wonder if this is you know red bull's just going to be good at this too and yeah, it's good just going to extend that advantage. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because it's kind of like the teams will the teams will find a way. They'll figure yeah. it out how to try and gain back all of that lost track time. Um, the FIA putting their uh, foot down on race celebrations. So it was it was interesting. I had actually had a number of people randomly reach out to me at the end of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, saying like, "Whoa, there's a lot of people hanging on the fence." Yeah, uh, from the team cheering for for Checo as he won, and I'm like. And in my head, I'm thinking like, yeah, you know, that's 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 normal. You know, I I remember that ever since I was a little kid, and it doesn't surprise me. And it's just part of how it is. But they're actually the FIA is like they're saying like they're going to start throwing around penalties here if teams keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, this was uh, I was looking at the um, the image that went went with the article on this on, on motorsport.com and I was looking at like how high those guys got up on the, the fence like hanging over the <laughs> overhang which I wouldn't do because I'm scared of heights but <laughs> these uh, these guys are really getting up there What what's frustrating to me about this is like the FIA should like throw a brush back pitch and, and say yeah. you know let's not do anything unsafe but there's an obvious middle ground which is you have an instruction to teams like hey keep the mechanics from climbing all the way to the top of the fence like you could climb the wall but like don't climb the fence if we're worried about you know people getting hit by de- by debris or, or falling off or anything like that but just saying you can't do this which is something that it seems like it matters a lot to the teams that they really like you know get a big morale boost from celebrating in this fashion um, and also, like, provides a lot of really, like, iconic images in terms yeah, of, for sure. of wrapping up a race win. Because you think of this is not a sport where you get the photo of the decisive touchdown or the walk-off home run. You know, you, you look at these historic wins, whether it's Checo's win at, at Sakir um, or Jensen Button's first win. And it's all, like, photos of the mechanics, like, sticking their arms through the, the fencing and, and pumping their fist. And, you know, I, I think we'd lose something. Not having yeah, that. like Schumacher's, uh, I believe it was Schumacher's seventh world title. Like, there's just like this iconic photo of like the whole thing is just all in red, and you can see all the mechanics' arms, mm-hmm. you know, going over, and you can see Schumacher like punching, punching the air, and it's kind of like well, those That's guys cool, should have. I mean, if anybody should have ever acted like they've been there before, Michael Schumacher by his seventh <laughs> title. <laughs> That's a huge record, though, man. That was yeah, awesome. I, yeah. I remember that, Dan. That was so cool. Um, dude, thanks very much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. I know we don't have you for too much longer, but it's uh, opening day in yeah. the MLB. And, uh, Mr. Bauman, you're you're covering it. So what's happening today, brother? Oh, well, the Yankees won today. Uh, so oh, I, yay! Uh, yeah. Same as it ever was. 
Yeah, uh, nothing has I changed. I mean, we got all sorts of new rules this year. The, you know, the pitch clock, the anti-shift rules, bigger bases, you know, already just in terms of we've already today we've had a pitch clock violation. We've had a lot of stolen bases. We've had some exciting rookies. So we're going to be covering that at Fangraphs.com, uh, which is the day job for me. So go and check that out. Also, we have memberships. We have special perks. So sign, I forgot to plug this the last time yeah, I was yeah, on your show. Up, so, yeah, so buy a membership to fangraphs.com and where you can get all sorts of uh, uh you know my analysis other people's analysis my thing that's going to go up tomorrow um, minor league baseball has uh their union has negotiated its first collective bargaining agreement so that's oh. one of the things that, that i cover is labor relations so hmm. this is a big historic day not just in terms of opening day but in, in off the field stuff too so i'll have analysis of that up by tomorrow we got a ton of uh, sports fans who listen to uh, the podcast and who are uh, who follow SDPN. Um, I picked the Blue Jays, Jays to win the to win the East. Uh, so it's going to save man. They're up. Don't three let one. me down. <laughs> it's the bottom of the bottom bottom one. They're up three one, buddy. What do you think? <laughs> They're playing I mean, the Cardinals. I, I, like, come yeah, on. I'm 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 climbing the fence already for my Blue Jays celebration. <laughs> uh, actually, um, pitch clock. What, what do you think about that? I love it. I've been saying since yeah. it, since since it's came in in September. I think it's going to be the biggest. It's going to be the biggest change to the way baseball is played uh, since the steroid era, and I think it's going to be the biggest positive change of my lifetime. I think like it's going to kill so much dead time. It's going to just. Baseball, the problem with baseball as a spectator sport has not been that it's long. It's that they let the tension dissipate too much between pitches. Uh, good point. And so just keeping everything moving, you know, making you know, making sure that, that the tension never dissipates, that you're just keeping the momentum of the game, letting it get into a rhythm, which is how the game was played for the first 150 years of its existence. And you know, I like it because teams have just, there was no rule about it, so teams and players just just took advantage of it and filled that void and the you know the league in the, those situations should say stop screwing around play the game right and that's what they've been doing so i'm really excited for it how uh, how much time do you think it's going to actually cut i know we're a motorsports show but like this is fa- it's fascinating to me how much time do you think it'll cut off a couple uh, hours so you think like it, what well in the minor leagues it was about 20 minutes a game uh okay. 20 25 minutes and something okay. similar in spring training so Okay. You know, it's something that you don't notice that much uh, during the course of the game, but it's, you know, it, it all adds up just a few seconds here and there. There mm. are 300 pitches a game, sometimes more. So you shave off a couple, couple cents, seconds here or there, and, you know, you're out of the park by last call, which is why sports writers like this. So. Brother, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. If you want more from Michael, you can get him on Twitter at Michael Bauman. I'm Tim Haraney. If you want more from me, you can get me at Tim Haraney on all forms of social media. Uh, please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts. You've been listening to Nailing the Apex, and we will talk to you all again on Sunday. <laughs>